Hi, welcome to the channel. In this video, I want to continue to look at that wonderful passage in Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus, where Jesus begins to open the eyes of those two disciples and then later opens the eyes of all the disciples that are gathered in a room somewhere in Jerusalem and he expounds to them the wonderful things concerning himself in all the scriptures, starting um, in Genesis and going right through the Old Testament. So let's explore that a little more. And I've got a lot to, to go through, but I'm going to try and just keep the comments short and look at quite a number of scriptures. So we'll need to, you might need to pause the video at, at times and just ponder the things that we're talking about, ponder these scriptures and meditate upon them to get the full impact. So as I said, this is Road to Emmaus, part two, and we want to explore what Jesus was talking about on this very first day of his resurrection. Remember, with the two walking down the road to Emmaus, Jesus said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And once Jesus had vanished from their sight, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What a wonderful thing it would have been if we had got that, that Bible study all recorded. But he has given us some hints. So let us try to understand what Jesus was saying. Because when he went back to the disciples and he appeared to them, who were gathered in a room somewhere in Jerusalem, Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That is the order of the scrolls. So we had this picture. So the, the first set of scrolls was the Torah, the first five books of Moses. And then the next set of scrolls was the Nevi'im, or the prophets. And the last set of scrolls was the Kethuvim. And that was not only the Psalms, but the poetry books and also uh, chronicles. So the writings, various other writings were put in that last set of scrolls. But I also mentioned in the last video is that Tanakh, is really an acronym for the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as we know it. The T standing for Torah, the N standing for the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the K standing for the Kethuvim. Um, they only put the vowels in so that the word would become pronounceable, and that was a later development. So it's an acronym of the Old Testament and or as or the Hebrew Bible as they understood it. Now, in the Tanakh, uh, even to this very day, in a Jewish Tanakh, all the books of the Old Testament are there, just like our English Bible or Afrikaans Bible, our modern Bibles, all the same books are in the Tanakh as we find in the Old Testament. But the order of the books is different. And that's really what I want to draw your attention to, to consider this particular order that Jesus is referring to, and to see the link and the development of the message right throughout all of these scrolls is absolutely astounding. And that's really what I believe Jesus was bringing to their attention um, in this Luke 24 account on this very day that he'd risen from the dead. So let's now look at the order of these books in the Tanakh. So you have the Torah which is the same as the Pentateuch in our Old Testament. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's exactly the same. Then in the Nevi'im, or the prophets, you've got the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. And what is interesting is in the Tanakh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings are considered to be prophets. Um, in our Old Testament, we would call these the historical books, but these obviously have got a prophetic message, and that's what the, the Jewish 
in the Hebrew Bible is presenting to us. Then there are the latter prophets. This is all part of the Nevi'im. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then there's one scroll with the 12 minor prophets in Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechari Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Um, those are all in the latter prophets. And then the Kethuvim, the poetry or the writings. We've got the Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. So the final book in the in the Tanakh is Second Chronicles. So that's how the order differs from our Old Testament uh, scriptures. Just to confirm that this was the order that Jesus was referring to, let's look at what he says in Luke chapter 11 and verse 50. Jesus says, Therefore this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. So he's going right back to the very beginning. And he says, From the blood of Abel. And we know about Abel uh, right back in the beginning of Genesis. Chapter 4, Abel was killed. And then he says, To the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for all of it. Now, why uh, would Jesus cite Zechariah as the final prophet? And the interesting thing is this. We find the story of this particular Zechariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. So right towards the end of Chronicles, which is the last book in the Tanakh. This is what it says. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper, because you have forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. But they plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness of Zechariah's father, Jehoiada, had shown him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, may the Lord see this and call you to account. And that's exactly what Jesus was quoting. So he was saying that from the beginning of the world, Abel was killed, right up to the end of the Tanakh, or the end of the Hebrew Bible, Zechariah was killed. So this is a confirmation that that was the order of the books that Jesus was referring to. So let's now try and trace the story that Jesus would have been telling these disciples on this wonderful resurrection morning. So if we go right back to the book of Genesis and chapter 3, remember the Lord said to the serpent, who is the evil one, the devil, Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So that was the very first mention or prophecy of someone who was going to come who would crush the evil one, crush his head, and in the process, he would have his heel bruised. So this is a prophecy. And while it's just a, a verse that we probably gloss over, this is a monumental statement coming from God directly to the evil one to say, I'm going to get you. And now notice this. The devil had used a woman to partake of a fruit of a tree to bring down the whole human race and to corrupt them and to bring them into sin and to destroy them. So he had made use of a woman and the fruit of the tree. And so God turns it around and he says to the serpent, I will use a woman and I will take the fruit of her womb and the fruit of her womb is going to crush your head. So this was something that was um, a statement that was made 
right at the very beginning of the Tanakh and the beginning of our Old Testament. And so this story plays out and is a menacing um, warning to the devil right throughout Scripture. So what we need to be aware of as we read through the Old Testament or the Tanakh is to realize that somewhere along the line, a woman will produce a man, produce fruit, and that man will crush the head of Satan. So Satan is watching out constantly, not knowing when this child will arrive, but he was constantly watching out for someone who would be his arch enemy. So a potential candidate arrives. Moses. And the question I'm asking is, could he be the woman's offspring? And this is a question that the devil must have asked, because God had made a covenant with, with Abraham. He had singled out this nation that came out of Abraham. They were now slaves in Egypt, and the whole scene was set, and the potential was there for God to send a deliverer. And so the, the devil read that story quite clearly, and so he put it into the heart of Pharaoh to kill every boy child that was born. And so that was what was happening to try and destroy any deliverer. So he, he was absolutely threatened by the prophecy that had been given back there in Genesis chapter 3. And so he was trying to annihilate any potential threat and to destroy all the babies in the time of Moses. But of course, Moses was preserved and he rose up to be mighty deliverer, and he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness and uh, was really a mighty man of God with great power. But was Moses the ultimate threat? So we get to the, the end of the books of Moses. At the end of the Torah, this is what we read in chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. And there the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea. So you could see the Mediterranean Sea in the distance from this Mount Nebo, the Negev Desert, and the whole region from the Valley of Jericho, the City of Palms, as far as Zoar, that's down to the Dead Sea. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on earth to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. So Moses was not allowed to go across into the Promised Land he had to stop there at the River Jordan. And then we are told at the very end of Deuteronomy, since then, so Moses died and God buried him, but since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So what a sad end to the Torah because Moses looked like such a likely candidate to be the Messiah, the deliverer. He was anointed of God. Uh, he was called of God and he had every indication to be the great deliverer that God was had promised, but Moses died on Mount Nebo and he was buried. And the scripture actually says, to this day, we don't know exactly where Moses was buried. So rather a mysterious end to Moses, but he couldn't go into the promised land. And no other prophet had risen up like Moses. So in the beginning of the Nebaim, the former prophets, Joshua, we now read, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, 
You and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. A wonderful promise to this young man Joshua as he now takes over the responsibility left to him by Moses. So it seems that a second Moses has risen up and uh, he looks like a very likely candidate. Uh, God goes on to say to him, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the scroll of the law always on your lips. Notice this. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So here the Lord introduces the fact that the Torah is something that needs to be pondered and meditated upon and obeyed and kept everything that is written in it. And then the Lord says to Joshua, then you will prosper and be successful. So as we move to the next book in the, in the prophets, the former prophets, to Judges, we read this. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. So they, Joshua was very successful and his, his ministry and his testimony uh, was intact. So he was a great candidate. But here, sadly, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So he wasn't the one. He wasn't the, the one that was prophesied back in Genesis 3 that would crush Satan's head. For they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Then, sadly, we see the result of his ministry. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. So a dismal end to Joshua's very successful run. But once he had died and all the elders that were with him had died, a new generation had popped up. And they didn't know the Lord. They didn't seem to know what Joshua had taught. And they forsook the Lord and went after the Baals. This is in the time of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So we see that what, what was happening in the scriptures is, as Jesus was explaining to these disciples on that resurrection morning, that right from the book of Moses, there was an expectation of a deliverer. And Somehow a deliverer rose up, but he, was, he didn't quite fit the, um, the, the profile. He, he was good and he um, presented some wonderful qualities, but didn't quite make the grade. Then if we go right to the end of the Nevi'im, the, the prophets, to the, the latter prophets, to Malachi, this is what we read. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil doer, doer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. So here is this prophecy now saying there is a day coming. It's the day of the Lord. And it's going to be a frightening day for the evil doers. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Then wonderful news. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. You can just imagine those calves just bouncing around uh, with such joy and such gay abandon. And that's really what he's saying. The righteous will rejoice. Then you will trample on the wicked and they will be ashes under your, the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. 
Then Malachi gives us another possibility, another candidate he talks about. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses, back there in the Torah, the decrees and the laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and their and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So there is someone coming, Elijah, a prophet, a great prophet. And we know something about Elijah because we've already read about Elijah in the, in the books of the prophets, and so we know something about him. What is interesting about Elijah in comparison with Moses is that Moses built an altar with 12 stones before the Lord at Sinai, and he offered up a sacrifice to the Lord. And Elijah on Mount Carmel did the very same thing. He built an altar with 12 stones. And there was an, a, a mighty anointing on this man, Elijah, and he did mighty miracles. So here um, we see a comparison between Moses and Elijah. And the Lord says, I'm going to send Elijah. And he will come and he will uh, restore the families and bring peace and bring joy. So here is a possible candidate. So we've made brief reference now to the Torah, the books of Moses, and brief reference to the prophets, the Nebuim. So now let's look at the Kethavim and the opening passages in the Kethavim. So, this so here is the first Paragraph in the Kethuvim, Psalm 1, says, Blessed are those who do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on his law day and night. Now remember who was told to do that. So Joshua was told to meditate day and night and then he would prosper. And so here we find the very same thing being repeated, which is a, a link back to Joshua. So these books are linked and you see a progressive message that is going throughout all of these things that Jesus was referring to. Those who meditate upon the law of the Lord, they will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So here is the tree of life, a tree that yields its fruit and it will not wither. It lives forever. So as we meditate upon the word of God, it can bring us to a point of eating of the tree of life. Then we go on to Psalm 2. And the psalmist asks this question. So now remember, we've got right to the end of the Tanakh and we're starting to read the first, the first two psalms in, in the Kethuvim. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The psalmist asks. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. So the, the, the psalmist is asking, why did the heathen rage and why did they um, rebel against Jesus and say, we will not submit to him. We do not need someone to rule over us. But is God concerned? Is he sitting there fretting over their threats? The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them with his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. And then he, he the, the psalmist turns and he says, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son or he will be angry and you and, and your ways 
will be destroyed. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So here in the final section of the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible that Jesus was referring to, we have this wonderful promise that God says, I will establish my king in Zion on my holy mountain. And I've said, he is my son and I'm his father and he will be given all the nations and he will rule over them and you had better make peace with him. So here is this wonderful promise of the coming king. So let's now just look at the connection between all of these sections or these scrolls in the Tanakh. We've got the Torah, and we spoke about Deuteronomy 34, uh, verse 10 and 12, speaking about Moses. And then that connects to the latter prophets, to Malachi, where Moses is again mentioned, and we're told about another prophet, Elijah, just like Moses. So there's a connection there. And then the former prophets, where Joshua is told to meditate upon the laws of Moses, day and night and that he would prosper so now we are told in the writings in the psalms psalm 1 particularly that we sh we need to meditate upon the law of moses in order to prosper and in order to eat of the tree of life and then in psalm 2 we are told that god is going to establish his king upon mount zion so jesus must have run through all of these great truths and probably many more contained in these scriptures to give this beautiful portrait of himself in the Old Testament. And then, of course, the New Testament opens with John the Baptist, who's come in the spirit and power of Elijah, just like Malachi 4 says, and he is the one heralding the coming of Jesus, and he is the one that points out the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. So let's consider the final candidate. So remember the devil has been watching all these men right down through history, wondering if this is the one that will rise up and crush his head. So Jesus of Nazareth, is he the woman's offspring that was spoken about in Genesis 3? And sadly, the wise men from the east gave the game away because the moment they came with the news, that they'd seen his star in the east and they knew that a king had been born. Immediately, Herod then, inspired by the devil who'd been waiting for this offspring to arrive, uh, goes and kills all the little babies, just, as, just in the same way as Pharaoh killed the babies in the days of Moses. So someone like Moses had now come and all the babies were killed. So Jesus of Nazareth has arrived. And what we find in the Gospels is right through the life of Jesus, the devil is plotting and planning every possible way to kill him and annihilate him. And eventually Jesus submits himself to his father's will and he allows himself to be crucified upon the cross. But what the devil did not grasp, uh, because had the kings of this earth known it. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is what Paul tells us in Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So while Jesus was being crowned king with a crown of thorns, and it seemed like such a dismal failure, Jesus was telling the disciples this on the day of his resurrection. That very resurrection morning, he was giving this wonderful story and this glad news, beginning at Moses, going through all the prophets and the Psalms, the things concerning himself. And here he was before them. He said, come and feel me. I'm not a ghost. 
I'm risen from the dead. I'm flesh and bone. And he was telling them this while he was having supper with them. What a glorious truth to know that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised one that has crushed Satan's head. And although he was bruised upon the cross, he has risen again in great triumph and great glory. But he didn't do this for himself. He did this for us. God bless you. Amen.